Welcome listeners to another episode of Advanced TV Herstory. I'm Cynthia Bemis Abrams, your host, and have with me today, Victoria Riskin. Victoria, are we Vicki or Victoria? Well, it depends how long I've known you. Ah, so... That's my answer too. <laughs> <laughs> so what do they call you, Sin? <laughs> uh, Cindy, if you knew me before I was 18. Yes. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, I've finally coming into the Victoria name a little bit, although most of my friends call me Vicky, but I like Victoria. It looks good on uh, on the paper. So It does. It yeah. does. All right. Well, then, Victoria, and more importantly, listeners, we're going to talk with Victoria today about all sorts of cool things. Note that we are doing our part here in late summer 2023 to honor the picket lines of the WGA and SAG-AFTRA by not promoting or discussing series or episodes of television, which is kind of a hard thing to do when your mission is like ours, and that is connecting the dots of TV and feminism to American culture and politics. But we can do it because we have fantastic people like Victoria Riskin who are willing to come on and talk about other aspects of TV history because she very much has lived it. She is one of the nine women presidents who served or is currently serving uh, the two unions or at one point the three unions because SAG and AFTRA only joined and merged not that long ago. And we're also going to talk about a book she wrote a couple of years ago called Fay Ray and Robert Riskin, a Hollywood memoir. Victoria Riskin is an award-winning writer. She has written for TV she was president of the Writers Guild of America West. She served 12 years on the International Board of Human Rights Watch and chaired its Hellman Hammett Committee that distributed funds to persecuted writers around the world. That matters now more than ever. And I think we could have a whole episode on the Hellman Hammett Committee because I'm fascinated. I just want you listeners to welcome Victoria Riskin to our virtual studio. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be with you today. Good. Well, you have a website. You've got a lot of irons in the fire. You've got stuff going on. But you are a second generation screenwriter. What did that feel like growing up? And explain who your parents were, because they aren't quite as obvious as some of the, the second generation Hollywood folks that we all know about. Well, I'll start with who they were, because that's always more interesting to me than talking about myself, but I'm happy to talk about myself, too. <laughs> so my parents were seminal in the formation of, of the motion picture industry in the 1930s. Uh, my father came from New York because of the, the stock market crash, actually. Writers started to flood into Hollywood. It was the only place that they could get work, journalists and playwrights and so on. His name was Robert Riskin. He was an Oscar-winning screenwriter. He wrote movies that maybe your audience know of or have heard about, including It Happened One Night, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, Lost Horizon, You Can't Take It With You, Meet John Doe, Lady for a Day. It was a very prolific time in Hollywood, and he was at Columbia Studios and helped build that studio and had a partnership with a director named Frank Capra, and the two of them were quite magical as a team. They, my parents did not meet uh, at that time, but my mother had come from a little tiny mining town in Utah to Hollywood when she was 14. The family needed uh, money, and she came by herself while in the care of a young man who sort of helped direct her to get into the movies eventually, first in the silent movies, and then she transitioned to the talkies. Her name is Faye, was Faye Ray, is Faye Ray. She's still in my, <laughs> she's still alive in my heart, but she's best known for her role as Anne Darrow as the blonde in the original King Kong. And I, I underscore, Cynthia, I underscore original because the original is my favorite of the King Kongs that have been made, but that's an iconic film. In fact, she made over a hundred films and into the era of TV which I know is your focus. So the movie industry was our life, as it were. We were part of Hollywood royalty when I was a child. And uh, Hollywood was a pretty exciting place. But of course, behind the scenes, there were lots of issues. There were labor issues. There were issues about communism and the blacklist. And all of that was sort of in the background, as well as people having a wonderful time and great parties and, and building an industry. 
And your father was then one of like the first 100 to sign up for the Writers Guild. Is that correct? Yes. So that was a very tumultuous time. And it's uh, I wrote about it uh, and found it fascinating to research when I was doing my book to to understand better the, the issues going on at the time. But in the 1930s, writers were sort of treated as fungible. I mean, my father was very successful right away. So he didn't face some of the issues that most writers were facing, but they could be sent to another studio without without them having any rights. Not they had to go. They other people would put their names on their scripts. They were sent on location, but they had to pay their own for their own hotel and their own food. There were lots of minor issues, but that were strongly felt by this collection of people who were writing for the studios. They also, like at MGM, had kind of an assembly line. So you would come up with a story and then someone else would do the dialogue and somebody else would do the, the character stuff. Uh, so, And they were cranking them out literally hundreds in a year. Hundreds in a year, almost like television is today, where there's a lot of, a lot of product. But the labor movement was growing and strong around the country at that time because of the depression and 25% of the working public was, they were out of work and those who were working were working under very bad conditions. So the labor movement came to Hollywood early on and the studios, of course, fought tooth and nail and you really put your career on the line if you signed up for the Writers Guild, Screenwriters Union. At the same time as the union was trying to get formed, Irving Thalberg, who was a major executive, and decided to start a company union. Those two things don't go together, company <laughs> and union, but you know, let creativity have its way. So they really pressured writers to join the company company's union, this other union. And my father was being pulled in both directions. He was very successful and the companies wanted him to join their union. And then he was being enticed by the scrappier group who were pretty radical, actually. <laughs> they, were, they were a wonderfully radical group. And so he was trying to straddle both fences. And ultimately, he was looking for a way to resolve the conflict. He was always a conflict-resolving kind of personality. And he joined the Writers Guild board eventually and thought he had, had brokered a resolution with the company union. And it backfired. A lot of people who'd signed up for the union, the real union, caved into the studio pressures. They had mouths to feed at home and mortgages to pay. And a bunch of them left, like over 100 left, leaving only about 25 or 30 folks who were members of the, of the real union. And my father stuck with that group and said, I've been sandbagged and I'm, this, is, this is the right place to be. And then he was a very loyal and active member of the union from then on. This is so interesting. And it's so, you know, it, it sounds so fresh and personal coming out of your mouth. And right, uh, listeners, I want you to know that the book that, that Victoria has written, Fay Ray and Robert Riskin, A Hollywood Memoir, it is so readable. It's like you're just reading somebody's, not not quite a journal, but it's just, it, it's not academic. It is real. And she goes into great detail, not just about this industry, the industry that both of her parents were in, sort of serving different purposes within that industry, but then also their level of activity that advanced entertainment and motion pictures through its most formative years. And they, there are some turbulent years, and you do a great job, Victoria, of describing them. How long did it take you to do some of that research beyond the obvious? And had you actually started writing it while your mother was still alive? Well, those are good questions. No, I waited until my mother had uh, passed away. She, I, I don't know why, I just did. <laughs> Somehow, I felt with enough time and distance. And she had written her own autobiography, a story of her life. And I felt a kind of permission that anything she wrote about, I could dive into and use and do deeper level research around all those people. So, but I felt I needed a little distance. And then I think there was, there were two other factors that really motivated me to write the book. One was reaching a certain point in my life where my father died when I was 10 years old and I really missed him terribly. So I didn't like, I mean, it was like I put his whole memory in a drawer. So uh, as much as I could, because 
too sad to have lost him. And then I felt, oh, I'm, I'm quite ready to go back and find him again. And so I did a deep dive into all of his, le- what letters I had that he wrote to my mother, who was a wonderful writer, and all the research and, you know, going to various archives and finding things. It took a while to put all that together because I was doing other things at the same time. But the second thing that really motivated me, which was quite a wonderful little story, I received a phone call from a German documentary filmmaker who said that she wanted to do a documentary about my father. And I was very surprised. Why would she want to do that? Well, he had worked for the government during World War II to make films for the overseas market, for people who had lived under fascism. And she said she wanted to do the film because people loved America in Germany not so long after the war, after we had been bombing their major cities. And she attributed that affection for America to the little films my father made for the Office of War Information. So I said, well, that's very nice. Call me when you have the money. And she said, oh, we're all funded. (laughs) Nobody ever says that in America. but. So I said, well, I would love, I I could tell right away, she was a quality person. She introduced me to the director. He was, he'd worked with Ken Burns. I said, I'll do whatever I can to help you. And so I, that also was a springboard for me because I went through all of the, anything I could find to be helpful for them. And all that helped me with the research I was doing for the book to find out where people were and what they were doing and what the attitudes were of the time. I thought that was a very interesting part of the book. As, as well. And so is this documentary now real and available? It is real and it is on Netflix or Amazon. Oh my gosh, I should know which place. Uh, but it's called Projections of America. And it's a wonderful little film about my father and about his amazing work during World War II. What I find interesting about this, Cindy, is that There have been quite a few things written about Hollywood during World War II. And this project that he did was so much bigger in scope than almost anything else that was being done during the war. But it was forgotten for a variety of reasons. First of all, he wasn't around to tell the story, nor were some of the others who had worked on this project. But they made maybe 28 little films. They showed them, they opened up 3,000 theaters in Italy. They were liberating, the army was liberating. Italy. They they showed them in France and Germany and so on. And the idea was they were just little films, maybe 10, 15 minutes long, with wonderful stories about the American spirit. And that would include, say, a story about what the what cowboys were really like, not the Wild West, like we saw in movies, but what it was like to be a, a rancher. And they bring a little uh, English boy to be the narrator of you know visiting the, the West. They have a guy washing windows on the Empire State Building, not to emphasize window washers, but you see the New York skyline. And you can imagine if you're a citizen in Berlin and you see the magnificent of the American great city skylines. So they picked a series of themes that reflected American ingenuity, American uh, welcoming of immigrants, which of course was slightly exaggerated, but they, (laughs) and they even showed images of blacks and whites working together, which was of course rarely the case. Right. But it was a, it was a way of sort of projecting the American ideal, not the American, always the harsher reality, but the better reality. So anyway, it was, they did these, they were shown in oh, hundreds of countries around the world, not just in Europe. It was a big project, all of which took place in about three years, the whole project. And this was before your parents met and, well, they had, they had met, they were sort of courting, right? According to the letters that you, in, you know, the excerpts that you put in the book. And then ultimately they married after the war. No, they married, they married right at, uh, they married a year, they married during the war, the first year of the war, Okay, but they were tied together (laughs) uh, (laughs) romantically uh, right before the war. Yeah. That's a story that should make it to the screen at some point. I think it's just, you know, it is 
it, there is romance and, and the letters prove, you know, the letters provide the script right there. Yeah. And you did a great job. Thank you so much. So discussing then, you know, your, your mother was widowed at a fairly young age for being an actor who also had kids and in, a, in an industry where nobody got really, really rich. You, you were probably well to do, but all of a sudden she's got kids and you needed to all go to college and have braces and things. Mm -hmm. So is that, is that sort of then what propelled her to shift over from the silver screen to the small screen and do Perry Mason and (laughs) and Alfred Hitchcock? (laughs) All of some of our favorites. Well, what happened was uh, when my father got sick, there was no insurance like we have now. She just had to pay all the doctor bills and the convalescent home directly or initially. There was no income because my when my parents got married, my mother said I've she'd worked since she was 16 years old, full time really, and she just wanted to stay home and take care of her kids and her husband and have a nice life. So she had stopped working in film, and now she finds herself before my father died without without any income. So she sold a big house, fancy house moved to a smaller house and she went to Lou Wasserman who had been my been my father's agent and said uh, Lou I I need to go back to work. Now Lou Wasserman who we all know <laughs> the zion of television really in early days he had been a good friend and come to visit my father when he was sick. He he was a despite the fact everybody in Hollywood who knew him was terrified of him. He was a very kind person to his friends in countless ways. I have many stories about that. But anyway, she went to him. He had just, Universal Studios was just establishing itself as a powerhouse in television. And she said, I need to go to work. And he said, start Monday and put her under contract. And so she started doing a little television series called The Pride of the Family, which was kind of a spinoff of Father knows best, you know, where the wife is warm, lovely, and understanding, and the father's a little goofy, you know, or problems. Anyway, Natalie Wood was her daughter in that series that she was so wonderful, magical. So she went to work and she got up every morning, went over the hill from the west side of Los Angeles into the San Fernando Valley to the studio before the crack of dawn. And then she began doing. That lasted, I think, a year or two. And then she began doing uh, the Perry Mason 77 Sunset Strip, you know, all of the uh, all of the regular and some some live TV. That was actually kind of exciting. There was a Playhouse Presents or all of those General Electric Theater. All of those. They were they were actually great. It was great programming. And so that's how she took care of us kids and earned our livelihood. And I look back at that and think, whoa, that's amazing. You know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. that's amazing. The experience that you, you had as a family without the kinds of union benefits that other unions maybe would have had of, of a disability or a pension or whatever, that came to sort of be important to you then heading forward in terms of how are writers represented by the WGA? But you're, you did not initially start off your career as a writer. You went off and did something else. Is that right? Or did you dabble before you went off to become a therapist? So I, I studied acting and theater, but I was very quickly obvious to me that when I got up on a stage, rather than wanting to do the part, I wanted to throw up. So it was, <laughs> I thought maybe that's a good sign. Maybe this isn't for me. I, I Pretending is not my best thing, you know? <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, but I became a psychologist. I have a doctorate in psychology. I love that. And of course, sitting and listening to people's stories, it's like listening to a television show. You know, people have really amazing lives and complicated things to sort through. And so then, then I found after about 10 or 12 years of, of that, that I really wanted to write. And so, and, and that started out writing a story based loosely on a case I had of a woman who had very limited social life, very career oriented, kind of a who came to me reluctantly 
but she had terminal cancer. And so it was kind of a collision of my having to deal with somebody who I knew was going to die and become close to that person. And it, it stirred up these memories of childhood for me, while at the same time for her, it opened up her memories of her childhood and unresolved issues. And so we came together. And, and, and so I, I, I was very moved by my relationship with this woman. And that became the first movie that I did for television. You know, and that was the, the, the heyday of the made-for-TV movie. And what was the name of that? The Last Best Year. And it was uh, Mary Tyler Moore played me. And Bernadette, Bernadette Peters, who you wouldn't think of as a shy, retiring personality, played the patient. And she was absolutely wonderful. Those two women starred in the film and then became best friends after the film. So that was a nice bonus for them. I can't emphasize enough, particularly for younger listeners, that the made for TV movie, when it first sort of came out, and there are there are some kitschy ones, and you know, then they've sort of devolved over to Lifetime and Hallmark Channel. But the ones that were showing on the primetime network TV were as close to this really should be on the silver screen as it could. It it had more to do, I think, with the availability and who got to the script first. And so you had big names. Bernadette Peters is huge. Mary Tyler Moore in 1980 was a very big name. Yeah. And and they brought star caliber talent to what became your script. We don't have that anymore. And the streaming services sort of think that they're delivering that, but they they don't that you can sit down and watch it with your family on a on a Sunday night and experience it the way that that's the way it was because now everything's so fractured. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, you knew that it was ABC Sunday Night Movie or it was NBC. Each of the each of the networks had these movies for television, MOWs, they called them. And it was a was two hours of a really well written, well produced, well acted story. And there were many excellent, excellent films that were made in that in that genre. They don't exist anymore because the streaming services generally are looking well, either they post or stream feature films that find a second life on streaming. But most of this made for streaming or Netflix or Amazon are episodic. So, you know, which is great. I mean, we all binge during COVID. But the sense of being able to tell a story beautifully, effectively in a couple of hours has kind of been lost in it. And it's too bad. And I think the difficulty that the companies have is it's very hard to get eyeballs. You know, they fight to get eyeballs for, for stuff. And so if you get eyeballs, you want to hang on to them. And that's why the series, the episodic stuff, is uh, where they focus. The downside of that is it's very difficult for some of these shows to do two, three, four, particularly five seasons. We all know, oh, well, I got to season five and kind of fell apart. (laughs) And, and, And I think just for the writers, you know, it's an exhausting thing to keep the balls in the air, you know, the dramatic balls in the air. So they were, they were wonderful films. I can, you know, name dozens of them that, that I remember watching and that had lost lasting, you know, memories of wonderful experience. And then, uh, then there was another interruption in that whole television producing process. So, so when, when I did these films, my husband and I had a company together making these films There was something called the financial interest in syndication rules. Cynthia, I'm sorry to go down this little rabbit hole. No, that's okay. We're we're teaching. (laughs) This is a class. But initially, there was a rule that you could be the maker of content or movies or television material or the distributor, but you couldn't be both. So NBC or ABC or CBS had to buy from independent producers or studios. And this created the heyday of Norman Lear and the Mary Tyler Moore company and dozens of small companies. It was a a very robust industry of people providing these shows. There was an incentive to be excellent. It was an incentive to be excellent. And also, if you owned your own company, you could make a lot of money. You know, like Norman Lear, some of these companies made a lot of money. We we did these two-hour movies. 
we made a living, a nice living. Now comes this thing where a judge says, and it's upheld by the Supreme Court, that actually it's okay for the major companies to make their own movies. So they no longer feel they need to buy it from the independents or the studios. And so they start, NBC, for example, starts making the movies themselves, but their incentive is to make them as cheaply as possible. Where our incentive was to make them as, make them as good as possible because we have a sense of pride as a producing company, or like Norman Lear had a sense of pride. Well, networks just, you know, they just throw an executive on, onto it and say, bring it in as cheaply as you can. And so that kind of killed dead the uh, movies for television business. And that was also occurring then at the same time that cable was really taking root in, you know, across America. It you know, sort of started out in pockets of the heartland and then. Yeah, it was later in coming to the bigger cities because the infrastructure just took more time to get embedded. But by the late 80s, certainly, cable was very much the competitor that the broadcast networks had feared it would become. And I think in the judge's opinion, and I didn't think he made the right decision, obviously, but he felt now here comes cable. So there's plenty of diversity. There's plenty of room for anybody to get into the mix. And in some ways, that's true. If you have a show that you deliver. There are lots of little and medium and big size streaming services. So there are a lot of outlets now, or even people create YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. But it's almost, uh, it's like uh, almost too much, you know? (laughs) I think that's fair. Yeah. So you were a producer, you were a writer, you had, looking at your record of the the product you put forth, it, you should be proud. What a, what a great moment to be able to step from one career into another and have success. And then you hung out for a while and then decided to run to be president of the Writers Guild. How did that all play out? I was very excited the first day that I was able to sign up as a member of the Writers Guild. First of all, because my father had been an early founder advocate for the Writers Guild. But beyond that, I was just If you've been in a room of screenwriters, it's just the best experience. They're funny, they're smart, electric, creative. So to hang out with a whole bunch of folks like that was was exciting. But I, so I signed up, became a member of the Writers Guild, and then I volunteered to get on a committee. And the once you get on a committee, then you get on another committee. Oh, she'll do it, you know. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's the it's the hazard of raising your hand and saying, "I'll try that." And so along the way, I became kind of an advocate for the Writers Guild in Washington D.C. by making a couple of trips there on issues of copyright and just trying to make sure that the folks in Washington who were making decisions about, uh, you know, uh, about copyright kinds of issues knew that the writers were in town and Jack Valenny and the studios felt they owned Washington, D.C., because they kind of did. Because of that activity, I guess. And also, I, they just, I was sitting in a room with a bunch of people and there was a lot of concern that the writers had not been making any progress in their contracts. There were a lot of issues that folks were unhappy about, and they wanted to run some new people for office, this little group. And uh, they looked around the room, and everybody pointed at me and said, would you do it? And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm, this is so over my head. But they said, we'll get you there. We'll help you win. And they did. <laughs> I, I said, okay, wow. I'll do it. It was a little bit like that because you spend a lot of time doing it. I mean, it's a, it's a like a full-time job that's unpaid. So some of the people in the room were producing, writing, and directing movies. They were very, very busy. So I think they felt, she'll do a good job. We'll, we'll help her. And some of those folks are still, are still involved with the union. There's this great sense of loyalty to the institution. So anyway, I did that for a couple of years. I read, I I can't remember if it was somewhere in Wikipedia or in your book, but you did make, you led, or while you were leading the WGA, there were a few significant items that you had that you wanted to get resolved. One of which was the claim within films, I guess it is, or maybe even TV films, when it says a film by and then a single name, 
explain what the issue is and how it got resolved and how important that is for all the writers who contribute. Well, that was a big issue for me personally and, and for every, every writer. And what that entails is when you go to see a feature film in particular and you, the credits come on at the beginning, it will say a film by Joe Smith, whoever, you know, the, and it's always the director. And the problem with that is that before a director is ever hired or brought on generally, a writer sits down with blank pieces of paper, 120 blank pieces of paper, or whatever, and puts down the entire story. And if you've read a screenplay, and I encourage everyone to do that, you see the movie. Everything is there, all the characters, everything, including sometimes the music, the dialogue. It's like reading. You should enjoy <laughs> reading a screenplay. And so that is the basis of the film. And then you hand that off to a director when they're hired, and they they do their part. They hire the actors, they find the, the sets, and and they bring their gifts, their talents. So it is a collaboration of excellent writing, hopefully, and excellent directing. So it should not be a film by, that implies that the director did everything. And that is unfair to the writers who are really the springboard for all the ideas and the story. So this has been a thorn in the side of writers from the 1930s and in some ways reflected my father's relationship with Frank Capra, who had a tendency to inflate his role, not, you know, suggesting that he, it was one man, one film, one film, one man. He's even said that as if the writers were fun, fungible. But he would not have got, he would have been a mediocre director without my father's screenplays. Talented visually, but he could not write a piece of dialogue of his life depended on it. It always bothered me that Capra took this, because when they were partners in the early 30s, the headlines always read, Riskin and Capra do it again, or Riskin and Capra deliver a great film. Then it began after my father got sick, it was Capra this, Capra that. So I had a certain historical feeling about it. We launched a campaign. Instead of saying a film by, we called it the vanity credit. And we mounted a marketing campaign to uh, emphasize how egocentric and narcissistic that credit is, and then sort of making fun of the Directors Guild, giving that to anybody. So what does it mean if David Lean has a film by credit or Francis Ford Coppola? Of course, he's a writer too, but I mean, and some little kid who just got out of film school, a film by Joey, whatever. So we mounted this campaign and we took billboards around town with some dialogue on it and the credit. The whole campaign was, um, who, this is who wrote this film. We were trying to emphasize the, the great writers. Uh, so uh, I think it, it, it always bothered the Directors Guild that we tried to make fun of them, but we never stopped. <laughs> Well, nothing like a team of clever writers who are feeling like they have continued to be overshadowed. Yeah. I, I guess I also wonder whether then life before IMDb and life before everybody had a Wikipedia page to or their own personal website to promote their work in the days before the Internet and before the IMDb and, and catalogs of how to find out what all a person had written on, if the only way your credit as a writer was going to appear was kind of in the very end credits because film credits changed somewhere in that time frame as well. You used to get a lot of the credits front loaded before the film even started. That's right. And now it's sort of fashionable to wait to the end sometimes. But, you know, the only thing a person has is their credits. I mean, that's that's how you establish yourself in, in your important profession, whether you're a director or a writer. By the way, I don't mean in any way to demean the gifts of, of wonderful directors. I, and, and the really good ones, the secure ones, do not insist on the film by credit. They understand it's a collaboration. And by the way, 
a good director has a good editor. A good director has a great cast. You know, there are a lot of people who contribute to the success of a film, and they all deserve credit. And leaders in general shouldn't, the hallmark of a good leader is one who can as, assign credit and not feel compelled to own it because they recognize the value and the importance of the heart that goes into any aspect of, of whatever the endeavor is that they're leading. Right. It makes, makes total sense on this end. So we were talking a little bit before we started recording about some of the other stories you have from your experiences, either in the industry in general or the, um, the work in getting to know Mary Tyler Moore and that sort of thing. And so you traveled to China as a bit of an ambassador? Well, that was actually before I made the film with Mary. We, it was in the late 70s and China was just opening up to the West. Mao had died and the gang of four, those were the people who were in his entourage and his wife had been arrested and, and it was a changing time. And so China was inviting lots of different professional groups to, to come in and it was a friendship program, but also to learn from seasoned folks. So Norman Lear put together a trip uh, with his wife and Mary Tyler Moore and her husband, Grant Tinker, and my husband, David Rintels, and I, and Larry Gelbart, who was a great writer, and his wife, uh, he wrote MASH, the film and the series. And so we went trundling off with a few other people in the group to China. And Mary, just a mega star in America, said, oh, it's going to be so wonderful to travel and no one will know who I am. <laughs> but, you know, that was sort of fun for a couple of days. And then there would be a crowd that would form around us, but it wasn't to, because of Mary. It was because of my husband, because he had a beard, and they were not used to seeing men with beards. And so <laughs> she would look and say, why are they so interested in him, you know? But a kind of fun story. So Norman Lear, if anyone has seen him in any way, shape, or he's the most wonderful tour guide, warm, lovely human being. And so he led our delegation. And at one point, we were sitting with the vice minister of cultural affairs in a big room with lots of tea and overstuffed chairs with doilies and old, very old fashioned China. There were no cars around at that time. I mean, we had, we had cars, but that meant we were great dignitaries. Most people were on bicycles. Anyway, we're sitting around and none of the people in the room, the Chinese had not seen any American television. And so Norman is introducing Mary and saying she is the most famous television star in America. She's a comedian beloved by, you know, audiences everywhere. And they look at her and they're totally uninterested. And then he goes around. <laughs> and we had Carl Reiner on the trip. He is the funniest man in America. <laughs> They have no interest in him. And then just going around the rest, you know, Larry Gelbart, great writer. Then they, he comes to me and he says, well, you, you probably won't have heard of Vicky, but her, her mother you might have heard of. Her mother was Fei Ray, who was in King Kong. These old Chinese guys leap out of their chairs and start pounding their chest. King Kong, King Kong. So I became kind of like the star of the trip. And I think Mary was eager to go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was great. She was, she was wonderful. But, but it, was, it was an amazing trip. When you look at China today, of course, I can't even believe it's the same country. It's, uh, there was a, 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 an amazing, it was an amazing trip. Yeah. So if that was the late 70s, then that's now 45 years ago. Everything is so different. I've been back to China. It doesn't look the same at all. I don't recognize anything. But does your husband still wear a beard when he Yeah, wears? he still wears a beard, but he's like, not so interesting anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, this says, uh, I mean, what a, what a life. And it sounds like you have many more stories to tell. I hope there's another book in the works or something where you, you know, you are just, um, you are a firsthand witness to so much history and TV history that um, we might have to have more discussions in the future because I get the sense you know a lot. So tell us, Victoria, what are you doing these days? You know, the book, the book came out in 2020. It came out. Yeah, it came out in 
2019. So I started uh, doing the road show and promoting it. I won some nice awards, got lovely reviews, but it was also in the middle of COVID by 2020. So some of the big events was nominated as best biography by the LA Times Book Festival. And I was picked out my dress to go to the big gala and everything, everything got canceled. <laughs> so I still have the dress. I'm waiting for the gala. <laughs> Did they send an award? I didn't win first prize. That went to a fabulous book. So I, I can't complain. When I read it, I hadn't even reached out to you. I was in the middle of reading it when I reached out. But as I got to the end, I just, and I'm not a book club participant because I just, I read so much and, and, and I think about it in my head and maybe with a few friends, but I think that this would be an excellent book for a book club, either of men or women, because you, you just you dance back and forth across your, your parents' experience and the, the politics of the day and the industry and everything. And it's just, it's good historical reading, but it doesn't feel like you're reading. Thank history. you. That was my, my goal was to take the reader not only into the lives of the two characters, my parents, a little bit my life, but really to feel the environment, the context, the, all the characters around them so that you felt like you were inside Hollywood, not looking at it through the long end of a telescope. But you currently are not sitting inside Hollywood or even in California. Your life now is in Massachusetts. Right. So I'm, I'm living now on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. It's beautiful outside today, sunny and lovely. And, and then I'm publishing a magazine, a digital magazine around the country about sustainability and climate change. It's sort of a lifestyle Lots of wonderful stories about what people are doing around the country to pitch in and make a difference and um, recipes and, you know, good products to buy and new way of thinking about where we're going and get to prepare for a more complicated, new and exciting future taking care of ourselves on the planet. And then uh, we're also preparing a television series, uh, which would be kind of a documentary series, sort of a 60 minutes kind of series, but with young people. <laughs> and so the, the name of the digital magazine? It's called Blue Dot Living. And Blue Dot is the little earth from outer space. And living is a, us here at home on earth. If you just type in Blue Dot Living into your Google search, you'll find our website. Certainly no question that as we've experienced weather in every part of, you know, the United States and certainly around the world this year, and it, the change is starting to become pretty palpable, we have to begin recognizing that the change has to be every person, every family, every business. And, and sometimes I think we're at a loss for what it is that we can do or how we can make those small changes that might add up. We have a daily, we have something called our daily dot that goes out. It's a little newsletter and it's just a little tip. You might try this. You might try that. You know, learning how not to throw away food and compost. Just start there if you can do that. If you have some way you can do it in your community or have a little composter in your backyard or in your kitchen. There are now some good ones that you can buy and, and use uh, at home. That's already a beginning. And if people just do a couple of things, if we all do those little couple of things, we start to make a difference. Well, it sure sounds like Blue Dot Living is taking a lifetime of wisdom and smart communication and is, is taking you into your next chapter of success and excellence and having having fun. We're having a... a we are actually having fun. It's amazing because <laughs> it's a difficult topic, but I have a fantastic team I work with, wonderful writers, no kidding. That's no surprise, right? And um, and so folks can just kind of come along the ride for the ride with us, and we would love that. We have about 125,000 subscribers, and we're hoping to get by the end of next year to about a half a million. So come along, folks. Join us. Yeah. Yes. Blue.living.com is the place to go. And then you can learn more about becoming a subscriber and getting that daily blue dot in your inbox and, and a way to make a difference each and every day. And then your 
personal website? VictoriaRiskin.com. That's a little less busy these days. <laughs> I guess I'm doing this. Sure. But you will find uh, some fun things, some fun photographs there. I tried to put some not only of each of my parents, but some of our family photographs and just some information about my parents. Each have very robust resumes of films they've made. And uh, so it's just kind of a nice place to hang out for a little bit if people are interested. I'd be honored to have anyone come. And Blue Dot Living is on social media. Is there one, one area in particular? Is it TikTok or Instagram? Yeah, we're not so strong in social media yet. There is a place on Pinterest, which uh, we're building. Maybe, maybe you want to come have a look. Okay. The reason I suggest that is that we're suggesting good companies. We're trying to highlight companies that are uh, using recyclable materials or recycled materials or organic cotton or good quality or low impact carbon impact. So we're building a collection. And so that's a, that's a great place for folks to go. You know, that's the thing about social media is we're at least fortunate that each platform, there's there's been a, a vision that has developed about how it can best meet an individual or an organization's communications needs. And you don't have to be on all of them. Right. If Pinterest is, is bringing it home and helping people understand it pretty quickly about what you're doing, then that's great. We are on Instagram, but it's, uh, it's not where we're putting a lot of our energy. We're, we're actually building our audience one-on-one -on -one with people signing up. And that's why I said we have 120,000, uh, 125,000 subscribers in the last nine months. So we're, we want to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with folks. That's great. Well, I have very much enjoyed uh, getting to know you and talking about a book that you should just be so proud of. And, and I'm mad that it happened, that, that it got published during COVID at a time when celebrations and awards and book readings and book signings and little receptions couldn't happen because I, I think life has changed now that we, we don't have those as often as we should. I loved writing it. It got good reviews, wonderful reviews, and people are finding it. And it did fine. It did just fine. And I'm very, I'm very proud of the results. So, so thank you for underscoring it. And thank you for doing what you do, Cynthia. It's fantastic. I am so grateful that Victoria Riskin was able to spend time with us today to talk about her incredible life and such wonderful life experiences that tie directly to the TV and feminism that we talk about here at Advanced TV Herstory. So thank you, Victoria, and also a shout out as well to Maisie the dog, who you may have heard in the background as Victoria and I were chatting. Find in your show notes links to all the things and the resources that were discussed in this episode. And including in that is the link to Jazzer and Take Me Higher, which is the jingle for Advanced TV Herstory, as well as the contact information for Mary Lou Morose, who is our editor, our tireless editor. Thanks so much, Mary Lou. Lastly, I will just close by saying this. Victoria is one of many activists who over the years has contributed their time and passion, and these are men and women, who want to make sure that working in the entertainment industry is a sustainable and stable position to have. They must be incredibly talented to get to where they are, to be able to create the quality programming that we have enjoyed, low these, hmm, call it 70 years of real TV watching. They are why I podcast. There are just so many great stories to be told and so many lessons about courage and principle and values that are really truly beyond just that industry. They are they are stories that all of us can take into our own lives to become better leaders, better advocates, and more responsible citizens. And that's why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. <laughs>